Thank you. Someone once told me that history is a darn good story. It just needs darn good telling. And I, I agree with that. Uh, I grew up in an old New England town, and I had friends from a young age who said their houses were haunted. I was really intrigued. Uh, so we'd have sleepovers, we'd break out the Ouija board, we'd try to make contact with whatever was there. And what was so interesting to me was that it wasn't like some Hollywood horror movie. It was just very matter of fact. Parents would say, uh, yes, yeah, someone else lives here with us. Please don't tell your parents, they'll think we're crazy. So this started a, a lifelong a passion of mine, and it got me asking a question that I've been trying to answer my whole life. What is a ghost? Well, I think there's as many definitions as there are ghosts. But to me, to make it simple, I think a ghost is history demanding to be remembered. It's the past coming to the present. And it's a way for us living people to bond with each other because we only share these stories with someone that we trust. Uh, I went to school to be a writer, and I started writing for newspapers and magazines in college. And I, uh, I got hooked around October looking into these ghost stories for feature stories. Uh, I would be fascinated with the history, but also really compelled by the eyewitness accounts. People who've been really shaken by something they've experienced, uh, and, and it just moved me. And I found sometimes the history could actually back up some of these legends and stories. So when you're a person who's interested in history and ghost stories, there's one building that stands above all others, especially in this country, and that is 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C., the White House. Uh, it turns out the White House isn't only the most famous house in this country, it's the most famous haunted house. And uh, what's so fascinating to me is that we've got not only over you know, 200 years of American history, but, but think about all the decisions that have been made inside this building that have shaped the world we live in. Has anyone been to the White House, had the opportunity to go? Yeah, a few? It's incredible. So I called the White House and I said, hey, I want to write a book about the ghosts of the White House. And they said, yeah, we're really not interested. And I said, well, wait a minute. I want to use uh, the ghosts as an innovative way to teach history to kids. And they said, go on. <laughs> Had them now. <laughs> so a little help from my congressman and a background check or two, uh, I went down there. <laughs> a background check that wasn't that thorough, obviously. <laughs> so <laughs> they let me in. <laughs> so I got to go down there and interview some of the staff. And it's an incredible place. Uh, you walk in there uh, and you realize every president stood where I'm standing. I know Washington died before it was complete, but still he laid the cornerstone. He was there. It's incredible to just feel that. The East Room is one of the earliest pieces of uh, folklore I heard about um, as far as ghosts of the White House. People report hearing the sloshing of water and smell soap and see an apparition of a woman hanging laundry. And you say, well, why on earth would that be? Well, it turns out when John and Abigail Adams first moved into the White House, uh, there was enough money to build the building, but no money for furniture. So it was empty. So Abigail Adams figured, well, we'll just hang the laundry in the East Room. And so that's where the servants would do it. But this is just a story that gets told and retold. I was walking through the building, and I talked to one of the Secret Service agents. And I said, what do you know about ghosts of the White House? And he said, well, people have reported seeing a British redcoat carrying a torch out near the North Portico uh, on the front lawn. And I went, whoa, that's got to be a, a big you know, security breach. And you say, well, what would that, why would that be there? Why would there be a British redcoat? And it turns out, if you dig through history, we learn in August of 1814, the British sacked Washington, D.C. They burned a lot of the buildings to the ground, including the White House. The White House was just left uh, as an empty shell. And there's two parts of the White House that have never been painted since then that still show those burn marks, one on the front side and one on the south side. And between that and this story, it serves a function, right? The function is... A reminder, don't let your guard down. The worst can happen. So we share these stories for a lot of reasons. The first documented ghost sighting in the White House actually belongs to Mary Todd Lincoln. During the Lincoln presidency, she wrote in a letter to her sister shortly after her son Willie had died of a typhoid-like disease. He lives, Emily, he lives. He comes to me at night, and it gives me great comfort to know he's not alone in the great beyond. His uncle Alec is with him, who also died as a child. Now, you could say that's just a distraught mother who's grieving her son and, and dreaming it and, and perceives it as real, and I might agree with you. Now, we know the Lincolns held seances in the White House. Uh, they wanted to reach out to their son that they lost, but then what, something happened decades later. In the early 1900s, a military aide named Archibald Butt, unfortunate name I know, <laughs> but it was his, he, he writes in his memoirs he got to visit the White House and interview some of the staff. And, found out that they told him it was haunted by the ghost of a little boy. And the only little boy to ever die there was Willie Lincoln, but they didn't name him. 
So the story lives on. By far, uh, the Lincoln presidency is, is the most prominent um, uh, ghost sighting. Uh, Abraham Lincoln has been seen throughout the building, uh, especially in this room, which they call the Lincoln bedroom. The thing is, it was never his bedroom. This used to be the executive office before they added the east and west wings. And what I love about some of these stories is that the witnesses are so credible, and I want you to meet one. This is Tony Savoy, the White House chief operations foreman. Tony's job was to go upstairs uh, in the morning early, turn on the lights, and water the plants. He was doing his job, and he looked up, and he says he sees Abraham Lincoln sitting on a chair with his legs crossed and his hands resting uh, and looked right at him and then disappeared. And he comes downstairs and he tells the assistant usher what he had just seen and he was told, you're one of many people that has seen Lincoln over the years. So these stories uh, live on and go on again and again. Now, uh, the staff aren't the only people reporting ghosts. This is 33rd President Harry S. Truman. In a letter he wrote to his wife, he wrote, I sit here in this old house, all the while listening to the ghosts walk up and down the hallway, and even right here in the study, the floors pop and the drapes move back and forth. Truman wrote about the ghosts of the White House in six different letters to his wife, talking about hearing things, hearing voices, going downstairs to tell the Secret Service, what are you doing upstairs? And to quote the president, damn place is haunted, sure is shooting. <laughs> There have been a lot of presidents that have talked about strange things. Hillary Clinton talked about how creepy it could be at night. Um, the Obamas allegedly had something happen in, in one of the guest bedrooms. Uh, and, and you wonder, why do we need these ghost stories? I remember hearing a, um, uh, a quote from, from President George Bush the Sr., who had said when he was sending troops into harm's way for the first time, he was really you know, struggling with the decision. And then he thought about Lincoln and what he went through and said, all right, the Lincoln presidency was by far the toughest. His nation's at war with itself, his son dies in the White House, and he paid the ultimate price for the office. He was assassinated. So maybe, just maybe, uh, these presidents need these, these spirits of the past to be with them and give them strength. But there's also evidence that shows up once in a while. This photograph was taken back uh, by the official White House photographer, Abby Rowe, back in 1950 during a major reconstruction. And ghost enthusiasts, modern day, point to this and say, it's evidence of the first ghost of the White House. Look way back in the corner, and you see this semi-transparent figure that's kind of see-through. And you say, well, wait a minute. Maybe he's just so far away, but those other guys are just as far away, and they're solid. This building is amazing. It's our house, really. Uh, American citizens, we pay our taxes. We're co-owners of this incredible building that's got so many stories to tell. Decisions that have been made in there have shaped the world, shaped borders, shaped our neighborhoods and our very lives, and have helped define who we are. Now, when I'm working on my, my books or research or working on ghost adventures, I call a lot of historic buildings, and I tell them, hey, you know, we're, we're interested in ghost stories. I, I want to find out more. And sometimes people get offended by that. And I understand, it, it does offend some people's sensibilities, but the reality is, I push back. When someone says, hey, you know, we don't want to know, talk about ghosts, we want to just talk about history here, I tell them, history is a ghost story. If you think you know everything that happened, every event that occurred, every fleeting thought, you don't, you can't, you never will. But these ghosts have a story to tell us if we just know how to listen. It's a way for us to connect with everyone who helped define who we are and shape us in every which way. These stories are alive. They're living and breathing, and they're growing every day. And they're an amazing way to communicate with our ancestors and with each other. Thank you very much.